Welcome to Lock and Key Unlocked, a podcast about Lock and Key, the comic books from IDW, and Lock and Key, the Netflix series that is dropping real soon. I'm Alex. I'm Justin. I'm Pete. And we are going to be talking about the final volume of Lock and Key Alpha and Omega. Now, requisite spoiler warning. We're going to be talking about the end of Lock and Key here. So if you want to go into the Netflix series completely spoiler free, lots of stuff we're going to be talking about. Certainly skip over this. Also, if you haven't, for whatever reason, read the previous five volumes, Listen to our podcast first. Read the whole book. This is where it all ends. So we're going to break down this volume as well as the entire series. But before we get into it, a little bit of background going on here. As mentioned, it's published by IDW, written by Joe Hill, art by Gabriel Rodriguez, colors by G Photos, and letters by Robbie Robbins. Alpha and Omega was the longest volume, seven issues, uh, broken into two series, Omega, which was five issues, Alpha, which is two issues. But the whole thing was released between November 14th, 2012 and December 18th, 2013. So it took a while longer than the rest of the miniseries. But as we talked to Gabriel Rodriguez about on our bonus podcast, which you can check out in this very Lock and Key Unlocked feed, uh, it was well-deserved. He needed the time to really break it down, put his heart and soul into the art. And I think we could all agree that it really paid off very well because... It's a Hell beautiful, yeah. perfect ending to a series, right? Oh, yeah. Just top to bottom. Uh, heartbreaking. So many surprises that are truly hard to read. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. I, I've read this before, and I still cried the second time reading it through. I just reread it again for a third time, the last two issues, and I cried again. <laughs> yeah. That's three weepings. It's, oh, Too many weepings. Now, before we get into a proper, we have been talking about the media history that's happening in the background with Lock and Key while the volumes are being published. Uh, By this point that Alpha and Omega was coming out, the Fox pilot was dead and there was no news the entire time this was published. But here's a very brief overview of what happened next to help lead us into the first episode of Lock and Key on Netflix, which we'll be recapping on this very podcast. 2014, Alex Kurtzman and Roberto Orsi announced that they were working on a film trilogy. 2015, That was no longer happening. So Joe Hill announced instead that IDW had essentially taken the rights back and were shopping it around as a TV show again. 2017, Lost's Carlton Cuse is on board with Lock and Key. It lands at Hulu, first with director Scott Derrickson, uh, who would go on to make Doctor Strange. uh, And then due to scheduling conflicts, I believe Scott Derrickson was working on Snowpiercer, all another mm. log delayed project. Uh, it went over to Andy uh, Machete, who would also go on to direct it. That was coming out later that year. 2018, Hulu passes on that pilot, which was crazy, but there was a bunch of uh, behind the scenes shakeups going on at Hulu. Um, and ultimately, though, they were given the permission to shop it around. They brought it over to Netflix. Netflix had Q's and company redevelop it almost completely. They kept a couple of elements from the Hulu pilot, including Jackson Robert Scott, who was the actor playing Bodhi, uh, and some others uh, that got recast in different roles. And finally, in July of 2018, Netflix picked it up with a straight-to-series order for a 10-episode first season. Q's, Meredith Averill, Averill and Aaron Eli Colette uh, and a couple more, including Joe Hill, were actively working on the project. And that brings us up to right now here in 2020 with a series about to premiere with 10 episodes on Netflix. After 12 years of development, it's finally happening, which is crazy. Absolutely yeah. crazy. It's so soon. We will get to fully take it in. Yeah, and finally we'll be able to forget about the comics and put them behind us because we'll be able to watch it on TV. Yeah, and obviously we have to throw away all of our comics when the show premieres. Yeah, Pete, do you have your matches ready to burn all your copies of Lock and Key? Fuck both of you for saying that. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Now, I am going to do a very brief recap for what you need to expect going into this final volume. because Thank you for keeping it brief. No problem, Uh, Pete. Very brief, only in the next 10 to 15 minutes of the podcast. Here we go. 
Here's the basics of what you need to know. Dodge, the story's villain, is in the body of the youngest Locke kid, Bodie. Tyler and Kinsey think they've gotten rid of Dodge, and Dodge, as Bodie, has gotten the Omega key and is ready to open up the black door that is basically going to give him everything he's wanted, and those are the stakes of the story. It's yeah. the end, very much so. As we head into Alpha and Omega, things are basically about as bad as we can get. So let's jump right into it. Uh, actually, before we jump into it, as we've done with the previous fuck. volumes, no, 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 I, I want to get your sense. I mean, we touched on it a little bit, uh, but what do you think about this volume as opposed to the others? What are your general impressions of it? Well, me and Justin are biased uh, because you were in previous volumes and uh, uh, this is our volume that we are in. Um, yeah. But let's talk about that. They introduced the character of La Page. Uh, and right. then La Page. Uh, and then we also get uh, Justin decked out in a suit. We'll, we'll get to the exact moments Funky later. Funky talks. Very How did that cool. feel to you? We talked. I mean, we joked around about it, but we talked about it. I was ludicrously excited to find out I was Dr. Zalbin. Uh, and that was something, as we mentioned, that I didn't even know about. It was one of the listeners of our live show was like, hey, did you know about this? And I was like, what? So do yeah. you remember when you found out, Pete, that you were going to be a lock and key? And Justin, when you found out you were going to be a lock and key, what was your initial impression? How did you find out? Uh, well, if the, the timeline was that we see Pete in Omega number one, and so I was like, okay. I think <laughs> after that came out, I mean, because what a convenient time to put oh, your old pal Justin in, in Omega. Right. Um, and uh, I, in between when the number one came out and the issue I'm in came out, we saw, I think we saw them at San Diego. And I was like, mm -hmm. hey, hey, Jay, guys. Hey, great. <laughs> uh, hi, what's up? What about your old, what about me? Are we doing this or what? And they were they were jerks about it. They were very they really <laughs> raised me over the coals, um, and were like, "Oh right, there are three of you." And I was like, "Come on, you're killing me!" <laughs> um, and then lo and behold, they put me in my my natural state, a very cool teen, um, which was very fun. <laughs> a very cool, very teen sharply lived. dressed cool teen. Yeah, that's exactly the kind of thing I would wear to prom. Right. Mm -hmm. Pete, what about you? Do you remember when you found out that you were in lock and key? What was your impression? Uh, I do. Uh, I was, I couldn't believe it was actually true. And it is my uh, Facebook picture and will be my Facebook picture until I'm 80 years old. Um, but also I didn't realize that uh, Gabriel Rodriguez put Joe Hill in here as well. Uh, it wasn't until the second reading through it that I, I realized that, oh, my God, this character looks just like Joe Hill. Well, it's him. It's both of them. It's Joe Hill and Gabriel Rodriguez are paramedics. Oh, my God, the, that is Gabriel Rodriguez. Yeah. There's actually oh. Easter eggs and cameos all over the place. They show up in the volume as paramedics. Uh, also, a couple of pages later, as Scott is going to get his new tattoo, there's, I believe it's Gabe's Inc. and Joe's Bar are in yep. there on oh, the street yeah. as signs. Um, and I think... Uh, we Joe's were talking pub. about this a little bit on the Patreon Slack, but you look at some of the characters, particularly this last volume, obviously we know who we are and what we look like. Mm -hmm. We know what Joe and Gabe look like, but uh, there's got to be a ton of other cameos, other people that they put in throughout, because you look at some of these drawings that Gabe did and you're like, that's a real person. That 100% is a real person. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. Uh, I'd be curious to know what the rest of the cameos are, because some of them I'm just not sure. Uh, um, what an honor, though. Like, this oh was so cool. Truly yeah. shocking and amazing. And I, I know we've uh, maybe already said this, but it was so exciting to see myself in that. But the even more exciting thing for me was on the thank you page at the end of the yeah. last issue. Yeah. They thanked the three of us, which to yeah. me is the craziest detail yeah. that they would Gets take the time to up. do that. Yeah, that Gets really got me. up when I look at it. Yeah, it's so um, good. Personally, if I may for a moment, like I was in a really tough place when this book came out and I was going through a divorce and to see myself like being split in half in a comic, like gave me a lot of hope and it really, uh, it really helped me. 
<laughs> that's wow. That's a wild statement. That's amazing. Why? Uh, I'm curious if you don't mind. Why was it specifically that? Was it seeing yourself in the comic? Would was it that it emotionally it felt like you were being split in half, or what was going on? Yeah, yeah, it definitely did because it was like uh, you know when you go through something like a divorce, you're kind of like regrowing half of you. You know, you're so intertwined with somebody in a marriage, so it's like. It was kind of like gave me like just like you're in a comic, you know, you're kind of murdered in this comic. And it was kind of like, you know, the fact that you were recognized and kind of put in something that this special uh, gave me a lot of hope for a rebirth. That's perfect timing then. Yeah. To have something so nice. That's kind of amazing, Pete. I love that. Um, All right. Let's jump in and talk about chapter one, Our Regrets, which starts off with this amazing and awful sequence. It's a close-up on the crown of shadows that's been hid on top of a lighthouse. Bodhi gigantic comes in. And we talked about this on a previous podcast. There's this fun monster movie moment with a kid seeing the giant Tyler fighting the shadow monster back in crown of shadows. And then they die. They Bodhi dodges Bodhi destroys the lighthouse and kills them all. And I think that's really all you need to set up the stakes of how big and how awful this is going to get. And yeah. just the the casual, like, violence and death, uh, like, it really puts the stakes, uh, like you're saying, uh, for Dodge to be truly reckless. No one's safe. Um, even these, like, super side characters who are just a sweet little moment, he just smashes them. The book smashes them. and it Just like you get smashed later. Uh, that's not one hundred percent accurate. That's uh, as we learned from um, from Gabriel uh, recently. Lived, Def- definitely no. lived. No, he definitely didn't. Uh, there's another interesting thing that happens right after this, where now that he has the crown of shadows, Dodge goes down to the pump uh, for the caves, so that he can clear the water out there, so he can get to the black door. And there's a enormous key mouth face thing. That yeah. I don't think we ever see what that does. All we get uh, is, I'm not going to tangle with you, big boy. I'm not going to, and I don't need to. That's the the master lock, I believe it's called. Um, and I think we saw it in February. Um, oh, right, right, right. I, I think the, the lock kids tangled with master lock um, at one point. It looks like something out of Mega Man, the old video game series. It does. <laughs> uh, which I think is so funny. And it's such a... Like, sort of cartoony, goofy thing in the middle of this, like, tragic uh, story. Um, But that's why the way that they can balance those tones and jump in and out, so good. Yeah. We also, throughout the rest of the issue, there's this lovely, excellent conceit where Dodge is pumping out the water. So we get this almost cinematic tone of uh, close up on the locations we've been to in the drowning caves before with the vroom, 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 just this tone beating in the background as we cut between Scott is doing a documentary on everybody's senior year. So we get to re-meet our characters. We get to see the settings of the place that we're eventually going to end up in. And it's just such a smart way of setting the stage, so to speak, of everything that's going to happen after this. Yeah, uh, the idea that, and they're giving advice to their uh, younger selves. Is that is that mm-hmm. right? Um, yeah. Which I think is just a perfect for this story, a story that is all about regret and just like coming to terms with the things that have happened to you in your past, uh, mistakes you've made or like reckless choices. And I think the, the story that Tyler tells and like struggles to tell um, throughout the issue is uh, st- another heartbreaking moment, but it just shows how such small events set everything in motion um, with Kinsey and he and the argument that got it, that happened right before his father died that he blamed himself for. And in, it, the series is all about him coming coming to terms with those very small choices that he believes for a long time ruined his life. I mean, and speaking of small choices, I think another thing that ties into that is we get the sequence of uh, Bodhi 
I, I don't even know what to call him. I guess Dodge Bodhi uh, walking through the caves, walking past his corpse that is still under these rocks uh, with the crowd of shadows disappearing to look for the black door. And you get an almost tiny, like super tiny, subtle little thing where we see one of Aaron Voss's memories that were cleared out, sneaking out of the rocks. And it's something that pays off so big later on. But again, it's these little details they throw in there that they make sure to come back to. Yeah. Yeah. I, I definitely missed that the first time kind of reading it and uh, was very happy to see that the second time around. Cause I was like, why are we getting the same panel twice? And I was like, Oh, 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 we're not. Um, But also just the, what I love so much about this book is just the heart that's in it. Like in the, the video thing, like he stops taping, you know, like that is such a thing that you kind of like such a powerful thing that you don't see a lot. And it was such a cool moment where it's like, why did you stop? You know? And then like Kinsey's uh, thing that she starts crying in the middle of talking about is just also so powerful. Like in the middle of all this horror and all this chaos, like you have such moving, powerful, touching moments. It's really what makes this book uh, so much above and beyond like any horror story that you've ever read. Uh, now, I have an important question about this issue. Pete, do you think the character of LePage is dating that girl that he's sitting next to? Yeah. What's up? Yeah, what's going on with her? Pete, tell us. Who's Maybe. this redhead? Dish, dish. Well, well I'm not going to tell stories out of school. Wow. Literally, I guess. Uh, uh, I, think also, so, I think so, because we see her later. Isn't she um, LePage's prom date at the end of the I think arc? so. Yeah. Yep. I see, mm. I mean, despite the... The splitting in half death. I think there's a real chance for this couple to pop. (laughs) (laughs) Um, I think so, too. Uh, We also get this great moment with Scott where it really sets up his arc for Alpha and Omega. Uh, He gets a tattoo of an enormous heart on his chest that says, ready to live, ready to die for love, friends, art. And that's basically exactly what happens to him that just sort of yeah. pays off for him by the end that's why don't yeah. get Such tattoos don't get tattoos that tell your future yeah tough this reminded me a lot of um moulin rouge the sort of philosophy from the movie <laughs> moulin rouge wow. uh to make a sort of sideways callback uh in our lives um which I, I think that's cool. That's such a very young uh, thing to believe. Like, I'll sacrifice anything for my art, my friends. And that's what, I mean, this story is about, like, kids making choices. It's just the stakes are so much higher for everyone. And we get to yeah. see that here. The other thing that's interesting to me about Alpha and Omega that, in my mind, is very different from the previous volumes is... With rare exception, this is all one big story. You know, they really focused on the individual issues for everything previously to this, and they still work as individual issues, but it does feel much more like chapters of this bigger story called Alpha and Omega throughout here. I I don't know if you guys got the same impression off of this. Uh, Yeah, I mean, it the way all everything matters. and such attention to detail, like you mentioned, is is un, it's so well executed without like the cool confidence in just like laying out details and then just seamlessly using them without making a big fuss about it with the writing or the art is is great. It's just masterful. Yep. Uh, and then we get that great last page to the first issue where. The looking in the shadow lady form, Dodge is looking at the black door in all of its glory, holding the Omega key and says, well, that's that. I win the end. Yeah. Yeah, And that's when I stopped reading. (laughs) That was it. That was the end of this. Yeah. Dude, you missed your whole part. I wish I thought that was a joke. We were all saying. Yeah, it was just a fun bit. Uh, let's move on to the second issue, which is a absolutely heartbreaking issue called The Soldier. It's a pseudo yeah. sequel to the previous Rufus Army of One issue. Uh, and here we find out what happened to Rufus after the death of Ellie Weed and his mother. He's at first going to be taken to a nice group home until something happens. Uh, he encounters the ghost of Bodie Locke in Keyhouse as he's wandering around. We also get this great 
frame here where he's looking up at a bunch of stained glass windows and there's banners that we do get to see later on in the volume. Uh, but one of them I'm blanking on the, uh, name uh, here. I'm going to look it up here, but I believe it's the, uh, open, open the moon. Open the moon. Yep. Yeah. We get the open the moon banner. We get to see, uh, the lock ancestors in the stained glass at the top. Uh, and it's yeah. just so much fun to have all these Easter eggs. There's yeah, a and big padlock in the middle of the stained glass. Open the moon hadn't come out yet, right? That was after. <coughs> uh, no, uh, here I'm looking at it now. Uh, Open the moon came out November 23rd, 2011. Oh, so, so all of this had been out, but it's like it's still it's sort of teasing and talking about things that aren't necessarily part of the main narrative. But the calling back and calling forward things that they do in the series is. It's really just like what I was saying, like the attention to detail, like being like, look, if you're paying attention, you get to see so much more of the world in front of your face. Uh, it really makes for just a nice read and especially a reread. Yeah. Yeah. Or a re-reread. Yeah. A re-reread. Uh, and then the awful things that happens is he finds out that Bodhi is a ghost uh, and that... Dodge is in Bodhi's body, and of course, he tries to kill Bodhi at that point, As which sends him, which is awful. He gets hit on the head by Tyler. We don't even get to see the hit. We just get cut to him bandaged up, looking sad, and ultimately, he gets taken to the same asylum as Aaron Voss, uh, yes. and then we kind of cut away from that. We get this... Sequence set at the drowning caves that is sweet and sad as Tyler and Nina reconnect. Uh, but then we really see what's happening with Rufus. He is able to break out. He creates his own key, which I thought was such a neat little thing. Yeah, and I'm, as everybody's... I what, just what wanted to say, po- yeah, point out real quick. When we see like his world, I love the fact that it's like evil place of evil is the sign Instead of the McLaren, mm-hmm. uh, physio- uh, you know, the hospital, it's just really just just like just showing you what a kid sees versus what's actually happening. It's uh, I, I just loved it so much. Yeah, it, it's great. And we get a lot of things that they're cutting to in this issue. They're cutting to everybody getting ready to prom. We're cutting back to uh, Rufus's memories of his time with Lucas. There's an awful panel of. Uh, Ellie Whedon, naked, bleeding, sobbing as Lucas is on the phone. We see him being burned by his grandmother. We see a happy memory with his mother. Uh, We see them again, all getting ready for prom. And then ultimately Rufus does break out and Erin helps him. She is yelling, stop, 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 dodge. Go stop Dodge. She's able to get it together. Uh, And we end with this beautiful, amazing page of Squadron Strange, the soldier. Rufus all roided out looking at the battlefield he's going to have to cross to get back to Lovecraft and save everybody. Oh, Uh, just everything is uh, there's so much in this issue. Um, uh, Any Rufus issue just always gets me. And this especially between him and. Aaron, Aaron Voss and the like really great capture of the feeling of getting ready and going to prom. Like everything is so Mm -hmm. bright and so exciting for them. They sort of, they've moved past their demons. They feel like they've conquered what what is in front of them, but they don't know just what devastation is coming to them. A little Mm -hmm. bit like graduating from high school where you're like, this is exciting. (laughs) This is the best time of my life. And you get out and you're like, wow, the world is much more, Difficult or weird Shitty. or not what I expected. Like the way they can just bring these ch- uh, k- kid feelings um, to this sci fi horror uh, fantasy and uh, match them is it makes it makes me cry. Uh, the shit that makes me cry is characters trying hard to just live their lives. And that's what this issue specifically is all about. Yeah, the I did want to call out one moment in particular that made me cry is so he has this robot soldier that he carries everywhere called Mayhem that he's working with. And at the very end of the issue, in one of his imagined sections where he's getting out of the asylum, the robot takes off its mask and reveals that it's his mother. And that kills me. Absolutely kills me. 
<laughs> it really does. Just hearing you say it, yeah. it's given me. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, and, and Aaron Voss, like a small, uh, a smaller character that we see most, like almost exclusively in flashback. But the fact that she's fighting so hard, she's a hero. Yeah, and as we yeah. learn later, like is like instrumental in saving the day uh, for everyone. Like without her, yeah. her role, that the Lock Kids would probably have have lost. Yeah, and the yeah. Earth would be ruined. So like that, I love that and. I also think this this volume is when Tyler really steps up and starts making choices. Like the last issue, yeah. he learns how to make keys. In this issue, we see that the lure is off of his hat. Like that's mm-hmm. the thing that's different about this is he's like, I need to move forward. And that's what he does. And to your point, what you're saying about Aaron and everybody, and we've talked about this several times on the podcast, but nothing is wasted. There's no additional unnecessary elements at any point in lock and key over the course of six volumes. There's no real tangents that it goes in. They manage to bring everything together and make everything important. And the fun thing I think about this volume in a a sad way, but the fun thing is they introduce extra characters so that they can have people to uh, kill off in a big, epic, bloody way. Uh, But even that, it's not like they're not extraneous. They're there and they die for a point. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Let's jump over to chapter three, Last Dance. Last Chance for Love. uh, Which... It kicks off with another absolutely horrifying sequence. Bodhi as a ghost is trying to talk to Nina. She almost hears him and then sees Dodge Bodhi wearing the crowd of shadows and Dodge Bodhi basically is like, ah, fuck it. I don't even care anymore. I'm so Not close to being done. And so just cruel. Awful. Gets Nina completely wasted She's been sober for 30 days, I think, at this point, is what we talked about. Uh, They talk about that in a previous issue. Uh, And the thing that's particularly awful about this is it's not exactly sexual, but it certainly calls to mind. And I think uh, somewhat subtly calls back to the fact that she was sexually assaulted back when Rendell was attacked by Sam and his friend. Um, yeah. So we do get a sense of that here, but I think ultimately what I would guess the point is, is this point she fights past it and proves also like everybody else instrumental in beating Dodge. Yeah. Like, yeah, everybody steps up despite how uh, laid low they are. And to, to have like this happen to Nina and then have it play out where Kinsey blames Nina and has this horrible conversation. The same thing that Dodge or that uh, Tyler had with his father before his father died is just like that repeated pattern of uh, just badness. It's, Mm -hmm. it's so hard to go through the same time. We see that everything is there. The darkness is closing in literally on by the, the shadow demons on Duncan in this. And uh, despite the sort of, John Hughes uh, coming of age stuff that's happening with Tyler and uh, Jordan. That's great. And like, just so fun and it feels so good at the same time. It's, it's mixed with all of these horrible feelings happening at the same time. Yeah. Well, and the other thing that's happening here, which we talked about a lot with the character of Dodge is he screws up constantly. Like he gets too cocky about things and him attacking Nina is a mistake because he gets her drunk. She realizes, and this is jumping ahead, but she realizes what's going on with the keys is able to see the magic again and is able to help stop him ultimately. So Dodge, not to use a pun, but like Dodge off provides the key to his own undoing at every single turn. Yeah. And I think what what I like about that, and we've especially later um, in alpha it's Dodge is, like stupid is like the, his goals uh, are so low. It's just like Mm -hmm. greedy, like childish gathering of power, like getting more toys. He's built up as this epic sort of like Sauron type uh, or uh, 
uh, Voldemort type like mastermind playing chess constantly moving uh, behind the scenes at the end he's just like a dumb demon kid who like wants more candy basically and I love I love laying a villain low like that after it's mm-hmm. been built up so high well I think that gets to the sense of when they eventually reveal what these demons from the southern dimension want is they just eat each other. They eat their relatives and get bigger and bigger until they get eaten themselves. And yeah. all they are is hunger. They're just want, their need, their id. That's it. So yeah. that dodge could even get this far as kind of amazing for a creature of that type. Yeah. Uh, so we do we get. get a, uh, oh, yeah. Go ahead. I would say Duncan says the title uh, of the book <laughs> at one point in here, which I thought was funny. The titular line. Um, I also think. It, uh, we sort of talked about this before, but like it really makes sense that the this this story all about the long term effects of uh, your teen emotions or the things you do when you're a kid climaxes at the most intense moment for teen emotions, the prom. Uh, yeah, like yeah. The, that synergy and that choice. I I love that because we get highs and lows packed so close together. Um, they, it makes it. I think it takes it takes me back to my version of it. Obviously, I fought shadow demons in my prom uh, as well. Yeah, um, sure. And I, I just the way that, humble brag. Yeah, I know. Well, you know, <laughs> I wasn't prom king, so I had to do something. Uh, and I also thought of a funny moment here with the uh, Carrie reenactment when you uh, remember mm-hmm. that Joe Hill is uh, Stephen King's son. That he's like including such a direct reference to his father. I thought that yeah. was cool. That's super fun. Uh, that's a fun moment. Uh, the stuff between Jordan and Tyler is very sweet. Tyler gets a tuxi- pink tuxedo shirt from Duncan. Oh, goes, yeah. Talks to Jordan. Jordan takes off all of her clothes and essentially seduces him. Um, but I don't know. It's still kind of sweet. Like, I, I yes. think it's cute that they finally get together. I love uh, this. I love this whole sequence. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, Kinsey gets home with her friends. She doesn't want to go to the party in the caves, which sounds reasonable to me. But then she yep. discovers Nina drunk, lying half naked on the floor uh, and leaves. And they end up ultimately going down to the drowning caves, at which point Tyler gets attacked by the shadow demons. And we're left with the final act of what is about to happen to everybody. They're so harsh to their characters. Every issue of this I read, I'm like, all right, this is the one where they're going to finally turn it around. <laughs> yeah. Nope. Not this time. No. Nope. Uh, and then the next one, of course, is titled Human Sacrifices because things are getting even more awful. Nina is completely wasted. Uh, Duncan and Tyler are trapped in the trunk of the car. And we get a fun moment with Duncan being like, I kind of remember this stuff going on. Yeah. Sort yeah. of. <laughs> Just like it's scratching at the end of his mind. Uh, and I believe this is the sequence where we get introduced to Justin, the teenager. Justin, Justin the cool teenager. There he is. What was it like hanging out with Scott, Justin? Cool dude. Very cool dude. Obviously, very chill. Uh, hanging out in the middle of the party, having a beer, looking around, being like, hey, rocks, I'm not scared of you. <laughs> you what's what's creepy me. is you're kind of looking at me making out in the corner, and I was a little like, yo, man, why are you creeping? You know what I mean? Oh, man, you are making out in the corner. Dude, got lucky on prom night. Nice. And they got very oh, unlucky. To got be very unlucky, I would argue. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I go from being lucky to very unlucky, but it's weird that Justin's watching. Uh, now, uh, Pete, I'm Dodge's, always watching. Always Dodge's watching. Dodge's stupid plaids. Dodge's body comes in. He's barely covering the crowd of shadows. It's like, help, help. Duncan got trapped out here. Everybody needs to come. And immediately everybody is like, what are you talking about? This makes no sense. And yeah. again, he's like, ah, screw it. It's too late. We're almost there. I'm so close to the end. And we get this insane double page spread of shadow monsters bursting up, throwing everybody everywhere. Just looks like Justin the takes a punch. He is like not clean off. Yeah, you are. You, you survive this though, right? Yes. Yes. I survive uh, at all. Um, and I ended up actually, cause obviously Pete died. Um, I ended up dating his, uh, prom date and marrying her. <laughs> <laughs> Fucked up that you would do I make that, out man. with her. Yeah. She also dies, mind you, but yeah. you know, yeah. We, 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 we can, can dream. Corpse. 
Okay. We could dream. Well, uh, we, we get this then, great uh, page where uh, the Justin, the cool teen, is leading the prom date, the prom committee, everyone at the prom, out of the cave. What a hero. Who, like, is... Is Strength. that a hero, or did you uh, push ahead? You're running away the from the fight. Is, Stop pushing, you assholes. Everyone out. Go, go, go. Uh, at which point, you get blocked. And I, I got to tell you, uh, we kind of skipped over maybe slightly more important. Tyler gets shot. <laughs> but, yes. Uh, but uh, the thing you've been but saying. But this other character, do... Justin Tyler, is also an important Tyler. Right. Uh, so the shadow demons knock down the caves and Justin says, yeah, as the rocks fall. No, they that's do mis- mention that people survived. That you're misreading that. I'm saying, yeehaw, I'm out of oh, here. Okay. You're riding no, the rocks to safety. You're getting uh, crushed to death, man, because the next page, it shows... Everybody's trapped. There's no hand peeking out. There's no Justin tuxedo. And no. you, you always do the wide zoom out when everybody's, uh, you know, dead. Oh, real filmmaker over here. No, I'm I'm clutching the bottom of one of these tiki torches uh, about to emerge oh, like an Indiana Jones type figure. That's that's tough, man, because those tiki torches, as everybody knows, are racist. So I don't yeah. know why you would touch that. <laughs> Yeah, that's true. Uh, other quick things that happen in the issue to other name characters. Uh, so Scott drops <laughs> into the darkness, wow. which is awful. Uh, Jordan, Kinsey, and Jamal are all trapped on a ledge in the drowning caves, fighting off these tentacles, these shadow tentacles. Uh, as we mentioned, Tyler accidentally gets shot. Also, Detective Matuku comes to try to save them because Nina calls her. And that's where we're left. Heading into the final issue of Omega, Chapter 5, The Fall. Thanks, uh, Salvin, for going back and uh, talking about the important things other than Justin's character. All equally uh, important, as we have uh, learned in this issue. Yeah. Now, my main question going into this final issue is, what's up with Dr. Zalbin? Where is he? <laughs> what is he thinking? <laughs> That's I'm surprised. What I know. He is He's such a creep. He's just sitting there at he, his desk, eating some Fritos, counting his money, not concerned at all about his, his other money? best friends who counting are his dying, dying in mean? caves. Yeah, doctors, as we know, get paid in cash. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So uh, they're always Scrooge McDucky ducky out there. He's probably looking at his plaque that says, I graduated from Cornell as he's ple- pleasuring himself. You know, <laughs> doing Dr. Zeldin things. What? <laughs> uh, that's hilarious. Um, yeah. I don't know. I mean, he does seem like the kind of creep that would go to the high school prom after party. <laughs> yeah. Um, um, all right. Moving on. We, well, Moving yeah, obviously on. we find we find our hero in red who leads the group out and is also a classically trained actor um, with a bit of a potty mouth um, and who understands modern prom style. We, we covered this already. I said moving on. Uh, I think yeah, I think it, you said I think you said moving backward. Uh, oh, okay. Well, let's so actually move on to you uh, because we very quickly get Pete's big death scene here. Yeah. Uh, while Kinsey, Jordan, and Jamal are facing off the tentacles, we get to see a little bit of Dodge's plan. He is taking all of the high schoolers, leading them down to the black door. And some people seem to be dying. Some people seem to be living. Uh, certainly, we thought Dodge's plan and readers thought Dodge's plan was to take over the world, turn everybody into these monsters just like him. Uh, but that doesn't seem to be quite it. And uh, thankfully, Pete and his date stand up to Dodge, say, right. we're not going to do this, just like the role playing game. But they find out it's not like real life. Pete gets chopped in half. His date gets I, I would like to say, though, I was very happy that I went out angry and yelling at somebody. <laughs> yeah. I would like to say Cheers it's nice him. to see that you have some brains in your fucking head, Pete. Yeah, that's what I was going <laughs> to say. It was great to see the inside of your brain. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> looks pretty good. Big brain, little yeah. thoughts in there about, like, <laughs> the Punisher and stuff. Well, you only used it 10%, so. Yeah. Well, the it's funny, though, because this does actually set up an important plot thing, which is that Dodge doesn't need everybody and doesn't, in fact, care about the lives of these high schoolers. He is very free without a moment's notice to just chop them in half, impale them, and that's fine. So that, again, does actually set up the stakes of what's happening here. Um, we also get yeah, to see what's I'm going on, on the stakes, outside. Baby. 
as Tyler is being attacked, there's a badass uh, Duncan trying to get the Whispering Iron. That's uh, what their mission is now. Uh, But as we cut back and forth between things, I do want to talk about this Nina drunk remembers the mending cabinet. And here's Mm -hmm. where we get one of the most crucial moments of the entire series is Duncan in the mending cabinet finally gets to talk to his dad or the ghost of his dad. And we find out what happened when Nina took the ashes and put it in the mending cabinet. It did bring back his spirit, but it couldn't bring back his body, which I think is such a beautiful, wonderful detail. And it's such a great scene. Yeah. It's such a good, uh, it really, uh, not to get too intense right now, but my father died um, about 10 years ago now. And this scene, especially rereading it, this f- killed me. It resonates. Wow. This and the last scene in Alpha, man, it's just so, it resonates so hard with Tyler. And it's so just emotionally true. Uh, it's it's great. I Really, really affecting. Yeah. Uh, so we get that scene. Tyler is fixed. Uh, and meanwhile, down in the caves, uh, we find out about the tiny little Aaron Voss. I would like to say though, real yeah. quick, I thought it was such a mom line kind of like you got shot. Don't do that again. Like I thought just the, yes. I thought it was such a well worded, uh, and so kind of like captured, like how insane she's feeling, but what, I don't know. I just really liked it. Yeah, we do. uh, The rest of the issue is taken up with Kinsey and Jordan and Jamal all on this. I don't even know if you call it just a balcony, I guess, platform. Um, And they find out that Scott has been roided out with the Hercules key. Uh, Their friend has the angel key. Is that what it's called? Yes. Yep. Yeah. Uh, And they make a deal. They say, hey, we can only take two of you. One of you's got to jump off. And they go back and forth. They talk about it, talk about their lives. Kinsey is convinced that Tyler is going to be a hero and come back and save them. Uh, But ultimately, with their backs turned, Jordan sacrifices her life and jumps off. And the final image is Jamal and Kinsey standing there is surrounded by darkness so sad. Such so a sad, sad ending to Omega. Heartbreaking end for Jordan. Great character. Um, and I love the way this exposes the sort of the demon's weakness is like they're like, you're going to throw one of the one of you off. You're going to team up and throw the other one off. And they would have never guessed that someone would sacrifice themselves. And that short sightedness of with Dodge and the rest of these demons is exactly what why they lose. And I love to show us that with this like gut punch emotion, emotional moment. Really, again, we say it constantly, but just like so smart and so emotionally uh, resonant at the same time. Well, that's uh, we've also talked about this quite a bit, but I think that's one of the things that (laughs) works so well about Lock and Key is it's. Yes, there's horror elements, but ultimately it's saying really positive things about human nature and our ability to push into goodness when the chips are down, which makes it more in the realm. Whenever I describe it, I call it a dark fantasy, you know, rather than a horror thing, because horror, you look at it, that is very focused often on how people go to these dark places and come out, but it's about the scares. It's about the blood. It's about the gore. A lot of the time, while this is a triumph of the human spirit at the end of the day, things are positive and they're happy and bad things happen to these characters, but it's about how they push past grief and become better people because of it. Yeah. So let's jump into Alpha. Let's jump into the last two issues here. These are two enormous issues, Alpha 1 and Alpha 2. They're almost... uh, Alpha 2 is very much the epilogue of everything that's going on, and Alpha 1 is the big one where it all goes down. It's the final battle with Dodge. We get revealed what Dodge's plan is, which, as you teased earlier, Justin... Initially, he wanted to take over the world, use these keys, uh, change the entire world and rule it. But instead, he was like, you know what? Why don't I just take a couple of people and rule the world myself with ruling family, create my own family for myself? 
we get these amazing panels where we see him subjugating the entire world as Keyhouse literally burns down to the ground. Uh, and at the same time, while this is all happening in the caves and they're making these choices and telling them they have to make these choices, Tyler does come in with a plan. And ultimately what he has done is he's created this alpha key that can unlock demons from their hosts, but at the cost of their own lives. Ugh. Just what a perf, what a beautiful gut punch of a way, like a choice where you're like, no, this can't be, the big heroic win is literally just like giving them the chance to die as themselves. Yeah. Yeah. But that's what it's about, right? I mean, that's where we started with Rendell is Rendell died against his will. It wasn't his choice. It wasn't on his own terms. His family couldn't make it as on his own terms. And ultimately that's what Tyler comes up with is giving people those choice. Granted, they've been put into a situation where a demon is attached to their spines, but at the same time, Scott very clearly makes a choice to be like, no, I'm going to choose when and how I die. And so does everybody else. Yeah. It's, yeah. It, you see like, it's ultimately the right choice and the, the characters are happy. I think that's important. None of them are like horrified that it's happening to them. So they're happy given the circumstances with what's happening, but it's, it's just no less cutting to us that the the victory is at such a great uh, cost. I love in this issue also, like, we get so much time in Dodge's head and Dodge's plan. And it's like so much of this story is all just about you're with the villain almost as much as you are with the heroes. Mm -hmm. And yeah. that's it. it makes us hate him so much more because we're so close to his plans the entire time. Yeah. yeah. And ultimately they do beat him, uh, by Tyler has hidden the alpha key. Well, yeah, I just want to point out yeah. R Rufus shows up. Well, yeah, I'm getting that in a second. So, okay. uh, Tyler has the key clipped behind his head. He unlocks Scott, uh, and we get this amazing visual of just people crying, the whispering iron because now yeah. it's turning to whispering iron inside of their blood. Uh, we get a nice parallel to what happened back in the caves decades earlier with Lucas, uh, with the tiny little flying Aaron Voss stealing the crown of shadows. Uh, and as the house burns, Bodhi as Do Dodge's Bodhi escapes, he's going to kill Tyler until Rufus grabs him, as you mentioned, Pete and drags him through the well door, as we teased earlier, and Bodhi spits out the girl, Lucas, the boy, Lucas, the demon itself, which also is just an echo and says, your war is over. And they all gather around as Bodhi lies there dead with the house burning in the background. And they're all just sobbing and they have basically lost everything. Ugh. Yeah. The Bodhi's death there, like, I can't remember what it was like to read this issue and not be able to instantly turn the page to, to read the next issue, what happens yeah. after this. But what a, what a, it must have been just a disaster to be like, they won, but like, the heart of the story is torn out. The characters we've grown to, the smaller characters we're going to love are murdered and die in a horrible way. Like, oof. And it's also in horror and in fiction, that's the one thing you don't do. You don't kill the kid. Like, you yeah. just, you do not. Like, that's a rule. And they break it. Granted, they come up with a very neat solution at the end. But to leave it off at that point is really such ballsy storytelling. Uh, yeah. I would argue they, they did set it up with us because there have been, a, like, a few child deaths throughout this. Like, with the lighthouse mm -hmm. girl we talked about earlier. Sure. Um, the Bodhi's friend who like s sees that Dodge that it's not Bodhi who uh, gets pushed in front of a bus like they prepped us with those smaller tragedies to take the hit on something this big uh, but it still doesn't make it palatable the I, I just want to say though the the Scott death with the you know the, mm -hmm. them holding each other and then the all in a day's work was just so powerful and like just so well done of like setting up Scott's like who Scott is and like I, I uh, just 
I just, I, it's so blown away with how emotional you get over these freaking characters, man. Well, it's also, it's such a nice parallel because I believe they're in the same spot as Mark Cho and Kim Topher were back yeah. in the day when they died in, you don't get to see a wide of it necessarily, but basically in the same exact positions as they were in. So there's so many different callbacks, so many different Easter eggs, so many different things that they tie up neatly here. And yeah. then we still have one issue to go, yeah. which... If if the idea of this book is about growing up and what happens when you grow up, that's where we end in epilogue, The Last Door, and the final issue of Lock and Key, at least for now, uh, starting right with Tyler. He now has a little bit of fuzz, like a little bit of a, not exactly a beard, but he's getting there, going on. He's wearing glasses. <laughs> he's an adult. And, yeah. Uh, yeah, Justin, he's got glasses on. He's an adult. Um, For those of you listening at home, I have perfect vision um, And I have to do this podcast with a bunch of mole men Who can't see uh, above ground It's true And there's so many beautiful things that happen in this issue I mean, just to, I'm just going to ignore that Uh, Just to keep (laughs) plugging through We get uh, the same page But with different characters and different ways it's set up uh, And Mm. with the funeral now Yeah Bodhi is cremated. He is in the urn. Everybody is sobbing. And it's exactly the same angle as when that other kid died that Bodhi pushed in front of the uh, the bus. bus. And I believe the same paddle as uh, Rendell's funeral back in the first issue. Yes. We also get Tyler sitting on the bench. But this time we flip the angle a little bit. We get to see Kinsey and Nina connect. Uh, and Tyler gets the car from Duncan. He drives back to Lovecraft, and we see the burnt-out husk of the house. And there's a little tease here that there's hope, because we see the sparrow yeah, in the corner of this paddle. From the yeah. cover of Hobbs and Zoo! Yeah, there's so many smart moves in this issue. And it starts off with letting us see Lucas again in the yeah. Echo, that he calls him out and he has conversations with him. Yeah. And he saves Lucas. I like, love which it. is amazing. The fact that this the the uh, Joe and Gabriel have such attention to detail, and then they give that skill to Tyler to like he goes back and it has the attention to detail to be like, wait, there's something undone. I need yeah. to f- release Lucas from this because he is still trapped with this demon, and it's just such a a, a great character moment for Tyler to like truly like he has grown up a bit. He's completing all of the work that needs to be done. And this like, not only is the the writing, but the art to show like uh, his face, Tyler's face when he dives into the well with Lucas and is like, he's facing like kind of like his Superman pose, just the look on his face to see the aging, to see the maturity, the determination to do what's right. Like, it's like a more badass Superman moment than I've seen in a Superman comic in a long time. Wow. Uh, wait, are you talking about coming out of the well? When he's diving into the well. with Oh, him. I see what you mean. Yeah, because coming out of the well, that seems to me it's like it's a baptism, right? You yeah. know, he's cleansing him of his demons. Uh, but then we also get Kinsey does the same thing. She steps up. Granted, she's with Tyler and they're helping each other out. But she dumps all of Aaron Voss's memories back into her head, yeah. frees her as well. And Aaron Voss is like, great, and gets up and walks out. Walks out that. like a boss. She's like, finally, I'm so yeah. sick of sitting. Yeah. Uh, we also get a funeral for uh, Scott, Scott and the other kids in the school. We get a beautiful moment of Tyler stealing Jordan's motorcycle and riding off with a ghostly version of her. Nice. And then we get the big reveal, the big twist here that is also so beautiful. A sparrow leads Tyler to the ghost door. The sparrow talks to Bodie, and we get a call back to that Eisner-nominated issue, Sparrow. Yeah. Where Bodhi's like, oh, thank you so much for sacrificing your body. And it's not 100% clear what happens here because they hide it. But I believe 
that Bodhi's ghost goes into the sparrow body, thanks to the ghost door, and then using the animal door goes through and is able to bring himself back yeah. to being a human being. Now, this is where I bawled my eyes out. Yeah. You see him Bodhi, coming back? Yeah, on his shoulders, on Tyler's <laughs> shoulders, saying, hi, mom, I lost it. It's it's perfect. It's perfect because what is more Bodhi than to be like, oh, I went through it. Uh, you know, I became a sparrow after I was a ghost, and then I went through an animal door, and now I'm back. Hello. Yeah. <laughs> like the it's, just the way that the the math works out for that to land perfectly on this. It's like just a gymnast nailing the dismount on, uh, yeah. on a story like this. Uh, such a difficult needle to thread to. Let the keys solve the most tragic thing of the series and give the audience what we are desperate for, (laughs) having Bodhi back. And they do it um, with just great key math. Um, And then you think think it's over. That's the happy ending. Okay, we did it. But then Tyler walks away with one more key. Well, hold on. I, I just want to mention one more thing about Bodhi before we get there that I've been thinking about quite a bit with this story is... Everybody else changes, but Bodhi, I think, stays pretty even throughout. Yeah. Why do you think that is? Because he was the perfect character. He was. He didn't need to go through an arc. He didn't need to do anything. He was amazing always. And I think he is not old enough. He's still in the magic mm-hmm. time, the sort of yeah. unending uh, childhood. The perfect time. Yeah. And so he... It, the the changes uh, the other characters go through so many changes like he's the stabilizing force and like in the key finder and the sort of catalyst to so much of what happens um yeah. he's a, an outside force yeah uh and then we do get this final scene as Pete mentioned and as Justin mentioned earlier uh where Tyler uses the echo key to talk to his dad once more his dad clarifies what was going on in the mending uh cabinet uh, and says that there is a world beyond this. And there's a really just beautiful thing where he says your body is a lock. Death is the key. The key turns and you're free to be anywhere, everywhere, two places at once, nowhere, part of the background hum of the universe. And it's such, such a beautiful way of ending, such a quiet yeah. way of ending. And ultimately, Tyler walks out of the door. He closes it. And our final image is the closed door with the end. And, and the look on Tyler's face as he like looks up after being with his father like that is just again I can't just say enough about the art and the the just the facial expression saying so much when there's no word bubbles. And one thing we forgot, um, Rufus comes to stay with the Locke family. He gets yeah, a happy ending, which is well. great. So yeah. great. Such a wonderful, happy ending. Now, there is one little note that I want to ask about. This is something that was brought up on our Patreon Slack that I haven't really thought about too much, so I'm curious to get your guys' feedback. But the last image isn't just a doorway. There's actually a death's head moth flying past the doorway, very tiny, about halfway through, which is an image that has recurred throughout here. What do you think that's about? Uh it's- I think it's like the the darkness is still there. I mean, it's it was a lot about death right there at the end. But the, I think the last time I remember seeing the death's head moth is when the kid Bodhi pushed the kid the in front kite. of the bus, the kite. Yeah. So I think like it seems like a happy ending, but uh, watch out. We're not done with these characters yet. There's more more bad things are coming for them. Yeah, I didn't notice the moth the first time I kind of read through it, and then the second time very much noticed it. And it is, it's kind of like we're these characters are in a good place right now, but they're still in this evil world. And also, uh, check out Silence of the Lambs. It's a good movie. That's, I think, what they're saying. <laughs> yes. Yeah. It's a plug for something else. Exactly. Yeah, uh, yeah I, I tend to agree with you, Justin, particularly because we know that there is more lock and key coming. That yeah, there this is. Story, this story is done, but there is more story to tell, and there is always more story to tell. And I think because it's a flying creature, it's also... It's a, it's taken as a bad omen, but it's also a good thing in a way. That as Rendell talks about, death is not the end of things. It's the beginning of other things, and I think that's what that indication is there, is that it's both at the same time. Yeah. 
Yes. I feel like there was a pregnant pause there where everybody wanted to say something as we finish uh, yeah. <laughs> all six volumes of Lock and Key, which has been an epic journey. Um, yeah. Are there any general thoughts about the series, about this volume, anything that we haven't covered so far? Uh, well, I think, I mean, uh, I think we could talk about uh, like what, what, what this means going into the TV series and what we think going into um, more Lock and Key comics, which we do mm-hmm. know are coming sometime later this year. Uh, and also, I just wanted to say, like, we talked about it real quick, but the fact that, like, Joel Hill and Gabriel Rodriguez not only thanked people by putting people in the comics, but then also did that wall was such a nice, touching thing that, like, also kind of speaks about the detail that they treat their comics where uh it's so thought out it is there's a lot of heart and everything and uh it's just great to see people make something that is uh beautiful and powerful and then also have the uh, niceness to thank people along the way it's very very moving book it is very moving uh and the other thing that i will say about it that i do dearly love about this book is beyond not a lot of books end on their own terms. And I know we're about to talk about further issues of lock and key, but I am always happy to recommend these six volumes to people because it does stick the landing. Yeah. It yeah. is a pleasure to read throughout. Gabriel Rodriguez's art is stunning. Joe Hill's writing is fantastic. The whole team clearly is so passionate about this and works so hard that it is something I could recommend without reservation at any point to nearly anybody because it has so many storytelling modes that fulfill so many needs that people might have and interests that people might have when they jump into comic books. Uh, So with that all said, I I will mention, as we touched on earlier in the podcast, there's a couple of issues that are called the golden age that do jump around in time. We're not going to cover those right now on the podcast. Instead, we will be jumping into the Netflix show, all 10 episodes of that. Uh, And as we talk to Gabriel Rodriguez on the podcast, that I believe by the time this is up, uh, the Chris Ryle interview will be up as well, where he talked about the other issues that are coming out. So we did review those books, though. We did review those books on our live show. Um, I assume we'll go back on this podcast at some point and revisit the Golden Age once that's complete as a volume as well. Uh, but what what are you looking forward to? What are you even nervous about with the Netflix series? Pete, I, 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 oh, yeah. oh, yeah, Justin, go for it. I was going to say, I'm not nervous at all. I'm excited. Uh, I want to see how this book is interpreted. It's such a strong story. To, so to find out the things they're going to do to translate it to um, television, uh, it's just it's also such a difficult narrative to like mess with. I don't know what you'd be like. Well, we have to change that. Like, there's some smaller things, but the story itself is so strong. I feel like that will endure, and we're just going to get more interesting ways of telling the story. Yeah, Pete, what about you? I'm fucking super nervous. I mean, this. Uh comic to me is a perfect perfect story a perfect uh, telling of something so then to take that and put it on another medium i'm very worried about it being as good of a tv show as this is a comic book you know what i mean Mm -hmm. like this has to be so powerful so intricate so well done i'm i'm nervous that it's gonna fall short it's in great hands Um, uh, so I'm excited for that, but I'm also nervous that it might miss a step. Yeah. I mean, I, I I think I could say without getting too much into spoilers, because I'm excited to talk about this with, uh, you guys that it's a different take on lock and key. And, uh, for my day job, I talked to Connor Jessup who plays Tyler lock and he said something that made a lot of sense to me is he looked at the way that he was approaching Tyler Locke as a different performance than the way Gabriel Rodriguez was drawing Tyler Locke. Mm. That it was both, there is this essence of a character of Tyler Locke, and they were coming at it in two different ways. And for me, that really, Kristen, how I feel about the show, and again, we'll talk about all of the individual episodes, is that it's almost like they're two takes on the same story. So... 
the the absolute best thing, and again, with we'll talk about each individual episode, but the absolute best thing about the show is it does not in any way negate the comic book, nor does it replace the comic book, nor is it a straight adaptation of the comic book. And I think what that means is for people who are coming in clean to the Netflix show, they can say, oh, this was great. I love this. Let me go back and read the books. And it feels like two takes on the same story, like almost if there was a folktale called Lock and Key that got passed down two generations. And here's two interpretations of it, which I think is kind of great. Yeah, I love that. Like there are different versions of a song like this is the Mm -hmm. electric version, the the acoustic version, a remix uh, or like different performances of a great play like. Gabriel did his version of uh, the characters, the like Shakespearean text, and then that's going in a new company that has like better uh, motion uh, or like a higher production value is doing their interpretation. And yeah, it's like it's they're doing the Merchant of Venice, but it's set at Venice Beach in California. That's also yeah. tough be- because like in a comic, there is no budget. You know what I mean? We're in a TV show. You can run into money issues. And not be able to maybe create the thing that you want to create. I will say, and this is a big spoiler, they didn't have the budget to use keys. So they're all made out of cardboard, um, yeah. which is an interesting choice. But I think it works well for the show. Yeah, no, it makes total sense. Cardboard. It's a real indie feel. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's like uh, whatever. I don't. I have no details about this movie. The The... The Michelle Gondry movie where they where they Science sweet sleep. stuff. Signs yeah. of sleep. Yeah, yeah. Any Michelle Gondry, anything. Yeah, exactly. I wouldn't <laughs> you can just say <laughs> Michelle Gondry. <laughs> Uh, All right. Thank you all so much for listening to this. As mentioned, we're going to jump right into the Netflix show after this. So stay tuned for when that uh, premieres. We'll be parsing the episodes out probably uh, daily or weekly. We'll see how we get to in terms of everybody's actual real life. Don't promise somebody we're going to release things daily. I said daily or weekly. That's a big span. Say weekly? Say weekly. I mean, part of the problem is Pete never wants to do anything, and he's got to get out of here, right? Yeah, Pete? it's weird. It's like I have a full time job, and you know, other things. This going is on. my full time job. This is what I care about. Yeah, yeah, what is it like to work, Pete? Tell me. <laughs> <laughs> is it like Justin reading a comic I, book, but um, at an office? As a doctor who gets paid entirely in cash, I yeah. barely have to work at all. So yeah, it I all know. works out. Yeah, this nicely. is a this is easy for you. So we are going to recap the Netflix series, so we will be jumping right into that. So definitely subscribe to the Lock and Key Unlocked to get the latest episodes. Uh, we, If you want to support this podcast and the other podcasts we do, patreon.com slash comic book club. We do a live show every Tuesday night at 7 p.m. at the People's Improv Theater Loft in New York that's totally free. We will definitely chat with you about Lock and Key. Yeah. iTunes, Android, Spotify, Stitcher, or the app of your choice to subscribe. Socially, you can check us out at Lock and Key Pod on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. ComicBookClubLive.com for this podcast and more. And keep it locked right here for plenty more Freshy Fresh episodes. (laughs) Nice. (laughs) 